Have you ever compared Jesus and Ramble? Today you're going to. Was Jesus fully human and fully God? Did Jesus, does Jesus get angry like you and I do? Was he, is he a mealy-mouthed man who always turns the other cheek? Was he more like Raymond and everyone loves Raymond? Or more like John Ramble played by Sylvester Stallone in his bloody action films? Perhaps. We will see. Remember back when churches did not have air conditioning? They lacked adequate ventilation and funeral homes advertised their businesses by providing fans on a big popsicle stick with a picture of Jesus on the front that made him look like a sissy. How many of you remember them? Come on now, I'm not older than most of you. <laughs> Suzanne and I remember them. Jesus was not a sissy. He did more, he endured more in his 33 years than any man who ever lived. If we study the two times Jesus cleansed the temple, you'll see that he was a man and not a wimp. Number one, if you're taking notes and I give you all the scriptures, we're not going to read them today, not all of them. But Jesus cleansed the temple, the temple twice. And if you study the, the events surrounding uh, these times and study the scriptures, you'll see uh, that Jesus was so irked about the desecration of his temple that he became very physical and literally strong armed money changers from the temple. Now, the people of God are the temple of God. And I don't know why I needed to bring this up, but, but just recently, 210, all of them, Democrat sen senators, voted that babies who survive abortion can be left on the table receiving no medical treatment. Do you think that might want, make Jesus want to take up his whips and drive them out of Congress? But he leaves that to us. It's our responsibility to vote and to speak up. Number two, the, the first cleansing took place at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. In John chapter 2, Jesus did his first miracle of turning the water into wine at a wedding at Cana of Galilee. Even though his time had not yet come, there was a few things that he absolutely would not put up with. Unfortunately, many American citizens and politicians will put up with anything, including gross antichrist promotion of abominable sin. Two school districts this week were, were having things about uh, teaching, using animals to teach boys and girls it's okay to be whatever sex you want to be. Um, God doesn't want us to put up with such things. Not Jesus. He won't put up with things. And his respect for the righteousness of God, for righteousness of people in this holy temple, was too great for him to stand by like a wimp. Now Jesus leaves us up to us to enforce his government on the earth. So consider the first time Jesus drove people out of, out of the temple. This, there's more to the story, and it's important we understand the connection between what Jesus did, when he did it, and lo and behold, its connection to the Passover. Number three, Jesus fully understood the prophetic significance of the Passover. John chapter 2, verse 13, now the Passover of the Jews was at hand. So Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now I know our modern world overlooks Passover and focuses on Easter. But Passover was given as a means of escape from the ninth plague of Egypt before Moses led the people out of bondage in Egypt. And Egypt is a picture of this world to start the journey to the promised land, which is a picture of heaven. God warned the people of a plague that would result in the death of every firstborn of man or beast in the land. The provision... Uh, for God-fearing families was that they would take a one-year-old lamb without blemish, slay it, and apply the blood to the doorpost and the lintel 
the doorpost and the lintel like in the, the sign of a cross. And this had nothing to do with sharp suits, cheery Easter dresses, beautiful hairdos. It, it spoke of the ultimate sacrifice of God in human flesh being sacrificed as a lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. Jesus fully understood his place as the lamb of God. He witnessed his story played out thousands of years before and recorded in the book of Exodus with the plagues and the, the whole Exodus preparation and journey out. But rather than explain it, I just want to share it with you. Number four, this is so important, this being Passover, is so very important. The month of Nisan became the first month of the year. It was always the third month of the year. But God said from now on, this is going to be, Exodus 12, 1, saying this month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. This year, Passover is celebrated April 22, which starts tonight. Now, don't think that's odd. The Jews begin their day at sundown. We begin ours at midnight. So we're doing the same thing, only they're, they're six hours ahead of us. But tonight, we celebrate, well, I'll read it again, 12-1. Uh, this month will be your beginning of month, so it shall be the first month of the year to you. In other words, God wants a new start today. He wants to begin a change today in your life. And paramount to understanding God's heart in that change is observing Passover. I'll tell you a story in a minute about this. Number five, God ordained Passover for every family every year. Exodus chapter 12, speak to all the congregation of Israel saying, on the 10th of this month, every man, so take for himself a lamb according to the house of his father, a lamb for his household, and if the household is too small for every lamb for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the persons, according to each man's need. You shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb, this is a picture of Jesus, your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Now think of that, parents. For 14 days, those families had this cute little lamb. And their kids played with it. And their kids fed it. And their kids begged to, to lead it around. But on the 14th day of the night, then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it. Imagine explaining that to your seven-year-old. Unfortunately, the church at large does not follow God's calendar. It blows my mind, I won't say that. It boggles my mind that we celebrated Easter in America four weeks ago on March 31st. Tonight is Passover. Four weeks later, after Jesus' supposed resurrection, we're celebrating his death. Something, something just off with that. I think it's so important that tonight Pam and I will ask the Lord if there's anything unclean, unpleasing in our home to him. If there is, we'll get rid of it. Then we'll go probably just to the main exit doors or entrance doors of our house and we'll take oil. We're not going to kill a lamb. Jesus already was slain for us. But we'll take oil and we'll put it on this side and on this side and then up here. And so we've made the, 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 the sign of the cross over our home. The blood represents Jesus' blood. He is the Lamb of God. And reading it from Exodus 12, 7 to 11. And they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts left, right, or right, left, I don't know how they did it, of the houses where they eat, and then the lentil. And they shall eat the flesh on that night, roasted in fire with unleavened bread, with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat it raw, yuck. They're boiled almost as yuck. 
but roasted in fire, its head with its legs and its entrails. Yuck. You shall let none of it remain until morning, and what remains until morning you shall burn with fire, and thus you shall eat it with a belt on your waist, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in the hand. You see, you're getting ready to go somewhere new. You're getting ready to take some new steps when you observe Passover. So you shall eat it in haste. My kids would have been good at doing that, eating it in haste back in the day. Number seven, observing the Passover provides great protection over our homes and families. Reading from Exodus 12, 12, and 13, for I will pass through or pass over, actually here, I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods, get that, you might want to underline that, against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am Jehovah. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the, the land of Egypt. Do you want Jesus to see the blood when he passes by your home, by your children, by your family? And number, nine, number eight, God's tradition of Passover is for all people forever. Some people say, well, that's just a Hebrew or a Jewish holiday. No, it's for all people forever. Exodus 12, 14, so this day shall be to you a memorial, and you shall keep it as a feast of the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it as a feast day by an everlasting. How long is everlasting? It's still and future both. You shall keep it as an everlasting ordinance. I received a call yesterday where we spent the day mostly at home and I was burning brush and I had to cut a, some dead limbs off a of pine tree. So I was out in the smoke doing all that. And a lady from Detroit called me. I, I really respect her. She's a, a, a state leader. She's written a couple of books. She's... Um, called me a few weeks ago, and really, her and her husband, that's an interesting couple. Um, she was probably in her late 60s or 70s when she came for a deep healing appointment, and at the end, I prophesied over her. You're going to be getting married. And she laughed. <laughs> and a couple years later, we were at Shekinah, and she said, I'm getting married, let me introduce you to my soon-to-be husband. And they're just a dear, dear, dear couple. But anyway, she called me because she's assigned to protect the children of our age. She's done a lot of anti-abortion work and written anti-abortion books. And her assignment was large. And the last time she called me, I need to start doing a, a weekly podcast again. And she was being hit, hit bad. Um, and I said, you need to, tomorrow night, you need to observe Passover. And I told her how to do it like I just told you. And she said, well, Passover was weeks ago. No, it wasn't. It's this weekend. Look at your Jewish calendar. We Americans are messed up. They're not when it comes to time. And anyway, she she. Uh, they were going to do it tonight, and we prayed for them and cast out a few demons, and, and uh, they were better when we were done talking. Number nine, Jesus celebrated the Passover as he had done with his parents every year. It only he knew, cross out knowing if that's in your bulletin, that's a double dummy, only he knew he, he was destined to be the Passover lamb. John introduced Jesus as, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Later on, the next day, John was standing with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. Jesus realized he would soon be slain on Passover. He knew he could not be brought, bought or sold, but he knew that the Father loved us so much that he offered his only begotten Son, who was slain, not that day, really, 
but from the foundation of the world. I'll show that to you, Revelation 13, 8. And who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have been written in the book of life, have not been written on the book of life, of the Lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world. Yes, Jesus was slain on Passover, but this was set up before man was created. Because God in his infinite wisdom knew man would sin, knew that we would need a Savior. So how do you think Jesus felt about the money changers and traders who took advantage of those who traveled miles to Jerusalem to take part in Passover? They couldn't carry their lambs that far. So unscrupulous businessmen bought their cheapest lambs they could find to sell at exorbitant prices to take advantage of this annual holiday. They weren't pointing, the money changers weren't pointing people to God. They were lining their pockets. A few years ago, Pam and I usually, Pam, Sherry, and I are the last ones to leave church every Sunday. But a few years, I, I was getting ready to go home, and at the end of our church driveway, there were people selling religious pictures and icons and so on and so forth. I knew in my spirit that they were religious. They were not spiritual. And righteous indignation rose up in me, and I drove them away. When they came back the following week, that time I called the police and let them drive them away and they didn't come back after that. Think of how Jesus felt. Imagine how he felt when he went into the temple and there was all these people trying to take advantage of other people for unrighteous gain. Selling animals, changing money at exorbitant rights, uh, rates just like you do at the international airports. Number 10, Jesus took decisive action against perverting a holy day into a holiday. Think about that the next time you celebrate Santa Claus instead of the incarnate Christ Jesus, or the Easter Bunny rather than the resurrected Jesus, or Halloween rather than Reformation Day. Behold what Jesus did, John 2, 14, 15. And he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business. When he had made a whip of cords, he drove them out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured out. I mean, this one man army poured out their money changers tables, uh, money and overturned their tables. That doesn't look like a sissified Jesus to me, does it to you? He was ticked. And the odds were against Jesus. There were a lot of money changers, a lot of tables, a lot of people selling lambs. They were profiting by sticking it to the people willing to use their vacation time to travel to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. Number 11, Jesus was and is a man of conviction rather than preference. Kilroy J. Oldster said in the Dead Sea Scrolls, a person who holds strong conviction might appear inflexible, impolite, or exceptionally obtuse when they are merely direct. Remember that the next time you think that I'm inflexible and polite. True spiritual conviction is based on the Word of God. Twice a month on Tuesday night, first and third Tuesday, I go to a group called the Writer's Mill of Sturgis. I'm there because I want to share the light of Jesus with them. And this time it was my turn to write two articles, one for the Sentinel and another for the Journal. And you write them, I, I can't forget the dates, they'll be a week or two before they're, they're, they're posted. But I took two articles and I said, there's one that you'll like and one that you're not going to like. Which one do you want first? They said, the one we won't like. So I read the article, there's no such thing as a free lunch. I posted them both on the, one of the bulletin boards back there. I think it's this one, but one of them, if you care to read it. And this lady turned bright red and she stood up. I'm a, a card-carrying, committed Democrat. And I bit my tongue. See the scars? <laughs> and she says, but, but we, will, we will look at your article and make make corrections in it and so on and so forth. I tell you, I'm where I am because I read this book through 
Old Testament once a year, New Testament twice a year. And I compare this book with what society is saying. I compare this book to how life is going. And I believe this book is truth. And anything contrary to this book is a lie. So true conviction is based on the word of God. Preference is based on personal, con personal whims. If you hold a biblical conviction about pornography, you will set before your eyes no wicked thing. If you hold a biblical conviction about lust, you will not look at another person and dwell on how nice it would be to commit fornication with him or her. If you have a biblical conviction about stewardship, you'll bring the full tithe into the storehouse. If you have a biblical conviction about righteousness, you will turn away from every unclean thing. If you have a, a biblical conviction about seeking first of the kingdom of God, nothing will make you forsaking the assembling of yourselves together. If you have a biblical conviction about purity, you'll stay pure. If you have a biblical conviction about sanctity of life, you will never vote for any pro-abortion candidate. You also will never drive when you are impaired if you respect life. Preference says, if it feels good, do it. Conviction says, if the Bible tells me to do or not to do a certain thing, I will do what, what the Word says, whether I feel like it or not. Remember, Jesus emptied himself and became a man. He took on an entire religious and commercial system because he was convicted that God should be on the forefront of everything people do especially when observing holy days. Number 12, there comes a time when one must not turn the other cheek. It's one thing to turn the other cheek when it comes to personal attack. It's totally another thing when it comes to standing on personal convictions about what God says. Jesus took, in fact, he made a whip of cords he confronted a gang of evildoers like Ramble would. He forced them to remove their ludicrous businesses from the temple of God. Now, I, I don't think it's wrong to have guest speakers or musicians to offer merchandise to those who want them. I'm thrilled that a man that came to the concert uh, on March 22nd bought every one of Jason Gray's uh, albums, and he had never listened to Christian music before. But I remember a well-known music band that, that we hosted back in the 90s on Congress Street. They pushed their wares. Man, I, they tried to sell their books, their albums. They tried to talk people into going on a high-priced mission tour that they were leading. I didn't buy any of their wares, and we never invited them back. That kind of stuff has no place in, the, in my eyes in the, the house of God. But picture what Jesus did. He was a man of conviction. He said to those who sold dogs, please take these things away. You think? <laughs> take these things away. And the only time noticed in, in, in Jesus' ministry did he take a whip. He took a whipping the only time he took a, a whip was his first time that he cleansed the temple. The second time he cleansed the temple was just before the, well, after the end of Jesus' triumphal entry to Jerusalem and just a few days before he was crucified. The, the first time he took a whip, the second time he drove the merchandisers out of the temple with his own hands and, and feet and whatever else he needed to to, to use. There wasn't a whip that the second cleansing. But what really sticks out to me is that zeal for God's house consumed Jesus and it brought great reproaches on him. And it didn't matter to him. In other words, Jesus loved God and the house of God to stand up for the things of God. America's greatest problem is not that evil people are doing so much. Her greatest problem is good people are doing too little. Evil people have a greater zeal to corrupt society than good people have to reform society. 
evil pe people speak evil into society. They vote evil into society. They evangelistically spread lies. They support evildoers with their donations and their services. Good people may complain about the way things are, but fail to step up to the plate because zeal for the Lord's house way does not consume them. One of the other people who kind of took a stand against me Tuesday night said, we just need to tax the rich more. The rich already have the highest income tax bracket of anybody. But she had believed that lie of the left that we'll take money out of the rich people's pocket and make it easier for the poor people to pay taxes. Bull crap. If they're being, having to pay more, they have to charge more. There's no such thing as a free lunch. You can read that article if you want to. God is looking for the ecclesia to be the called out assembled body of Christ. He's looking for the ecclesia to be a group that will pray until strongholds are demolished and witness until multitudes are saved and give their lives for the cause of Christ. Jesus did not do evangelism the way most of us do. I think it's a travesty to try to push people into repeating a short prayer of salvation and then have them write the date of their decision in the front of their Bibles and let them go on living like they lived before they prayed that little baby Jesus prayer. Jesus never asked people to pray a short prayer after him. He said, follow me. He called them to repent. Now there's an exception to this. When I lead men to Christ at the jail, I usually have half an hour, and we go through the John 3.16 diagram. Wednesday of this week, uh, the doorbell rang, and there was a man that was being kicked out of his house and wanted money to help him get back on his tracks, and he was going to drive or walk to Arizona where his parents lived. And I invited him in, and I gave him some resources he could look at for himself, but I said, we have a great big church building with lots of upkeep. We've got a small church family. Um, we don't have the money to give you. But let me ask you a question. Do you have Jesus? No. Well, you can have Jesus. And I took my very best pen, one we got, was given at LifeBridge a couple of weeks ago, and I said, I want to give you this pen. And I handed it to him and he took it and I said, when did it become yours? And he said, when you gave it to me. He said, no, not really. He said, give it back and I'll give it right back to you. I'm giving you this pen. And he took it. I said, when did it become yours when I took it? Well, Jesus will become yours when you take him because John 1, 12 says, but as many as received him to them gave you the right to become the children of God, even those who believe on his name and I led them to Christ. And, but I don't like doing it that way. I, I like having more time than I had with him. But consider how Jesus led people to Christ. In Matthew 16, Jesus rebuked um, the man uh, shortly after he proclaimed his name. You'll think of who the man is. He just said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And seconds later, uh, God changed his name from Simon to Petros, which means little rock, built on the big rock. And Jesus indicated Peter's confession as Messiah was a rock upon which he would build his church and the gates of hell would not prevail against it. In other words, Jesus was saying, build on this rock, don't sit on it. But Peter was still wishy-washy and Jesus let him have it. Matthew 16, 23 to 25. But he turned to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You're an offense to me. For you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Then Jesus said to his disciple, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself. Let him take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Or the King James says the same will find it. Jesus calls his followers to greater sacrifice and surrendered lives. Mark chapter 8 says basically the same thing. When he had called the people to himself, 
with his disciples also, he said to them, Whoever desires to come to me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the Gospels will save it. In Mark chapter 3, we read about a young, rich young ruler. And ask God to speak to you today. I meant to say that at the very beginning. But God has a word for you through his word that will be life-giving. So take a second. God, speak to me today. So in Mark chapter 9, a rich young ruler came under conviction of the point he asked Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus began with what the young man already knew. Treat people nice. He, he listed the last six of the Ten Commandments. And the man said, I've obeyed them from my youth. And Jesus did not have this man write the date of his decision on the front of his Torah. Listen to what Jesus did say. Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him enough to tell the truth. I added that. And said to him, one thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have and give to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven and come take up the cross and follow me. And sadly, if you remember the story, the rich young ruler went away sorrowful because he had great possessions and he wasn't yet ready to say all to Jesus, I surrender, I surrender all. I think this man later came to a place of conviction. He stewed on it for a while. And he came to a place where he was willing to take, take up his cross and follow Jesus. And I can't prove this to you, but I think we see that rich young ruler again in Acts chapter 4, where Joseph, or Joseph, depending on the translation you read, sold his possessions and laid the money at the apostles' feet, Mark 10, 36. And Joseph, who was also called Barnabas um, by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite from the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. This man was nicknamed Barnabas because nothing encourages church leaders and apostles more than people who are willing to give their all to advance the cause of Christ. Luke chapter 9, 23 to 24 shares the heart of Jesus for those who wish to be his disciples. He said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me. Jesus never taught cheap salvation. It is free. Christ paid the price for it. But he never preached salvation without preaching, follow me. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take over his cross daily, not a one-time thing, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Now the Bible says zeal for the Lord's house consume Jesus. That begs the question, does zeal for the Lord's house consume you? If not, please don't turn sadly away. Turn away from the call of Jesus, you'll become discouraged. I'm going here and there, but I'm taking you there now. In Numbers chapter 14, or 21 verses 4 to 9, the soul of the people had become discouraged to the point that they were complaining a lot. And it's interesting that the soul of the people, it was a, a shared soul of the people was discouraged and they were complaining a lot and the Lord didn't like it so he sent fiery serpents among the people and they bit the people and many of the people of Israel died numbers 21 verse 6 and the people saw people dying all around them and they finally confessed their complaining fault finding rebellious ways to Moses and said Moses please pray for me for us. 
And God said, make a fiery serpent, this was to Moses, set it on a pole, and it shall be everyone who is bitten, when he looks at him shall live. Numbers 21, 8. John chapter 3, 14, two verses before John 3, 16, compares setting the fiery serpent on a pole to lifting Jesus up on the cross. If we fix our eyes on Jesus, on the price that he paid for our salvation, is it not reasonable to take up our crosses and follow him? A cross is a, a tool of crucifixion. And one last verse I'm going to read today, penned by one apostate, Saul of Tarsus, one who thought he was doing good when he was only being religious, but his life's defining moment was when he made Christ, his, Christ Jesus, his Lord, his master, and the chief kahuna of his life. Later, Paul wrote this in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live. It's not about me anymore. But Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the faith in the flesh I will live by faith in the Son of God who loved himself and gave himself for me. Again, zeal for the house, Lord's house consumed Jesus to the point that he bore our sins in his own body on the cross that we might die to selfish, I control, it's all about me lives and center our lives completely to Jesus as completely as Jesus rendered his life to God for us, that we might be saved and seek first the kingdom of God. Let me leave you with a question. Do you have the zeal of the Lord of hosts? Do you have the zeal that will drive you forward in the kingdom of God? You have the zeal that will make you never, never, never quit, give up, forsake the things of God. If not, you need to ask for it. Because if you don't have that kind of zeal, you're not imitating Christ very well. Would you stand? Lord, so often when we sing songs, oh, to be like you, oh, to be like you, we want to be popular like you were when the crowds adored you. We want to be used by you like you were when you healed the blind, raised the dead. We never think about being like you when it comes to dying for your sake, for standing regardless of cost for speaking up regardless of what men might think of us. Jesus, I do want to be like you. I want us to be like you. And I sense if you listen closely to what the Spirit is saying, He's saying, I want you to be like Jesus. Will you go all the way? Will you take up your cross? Will you follow him? And so just between you and him, say yes. Yes, Lord. Not about me. Not about my will, my way. It's about you. Your kingdom. Lord, I ask you to bless us with a heart of sacrifice that leads us into the full will of God. I ask you to bless us with a willingness, even a thirst for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, trusting that you'll take care of everything else. If there's an agenda today that you need to sacrifice to the Lord, today's a good day to surrender it. 
I just want this to happen. I just want this to happen. I want to make this happen. Being totally sold out means I want your will to happen. So Lord, bless us with that Holy Spirit conviction. You've already given us the means and the grace to walk it out. All we need to do is be crucified with you. So Lord, help us to observe Passover, first of all, right here in our hearts today. Then as you lead us to do it in your homes, in our homes, in Jesus' name. Amen.